Welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to have all of you with us. Uh, Sam and I, as you know, we do hospitality talks. We are thrilled to have been invited by Bus Travel Expo to put this session together for you. Sam, how's your day been? It's been fantastic, and I'm especially delighted to that we can uh, have a show on uh, on this Digital Travel Expo. So it's, I'm really excited, and also to make some new friends for during this panel discussion, and also the, all the viewers who are joining us. So please to give you put some uh, nice questions together for the panelists to make our uh, discussions more livelier. So I look forward to it. Sam, you have it easy today because typically for hospitality talks, you are doing all the techie things. Today, it's being done by our colleagues. So uh, you have a lot of time today. Well, I, I'm really happy about that. It's a nice change. So I think we need to consider how we're going to do this in the future. <laughs> so you want to you uh, tell a little bit about the hospitality talk so that our viewers would know? Sure. Uh, well, uh, we started in, uh, in February, in fact. We started to talk about the concept of hospitality talks uh, with Abid. And uh, we thought we want to... Uh, have a, a, a discussion which relates to the burning topics uh, and also that goes in everybody's mind. Uh, and this was be before the uh, COVID <clears throat> was hitting us. And uh, when we came, when actually that started, then we started around the world uh, for uh, hospitality professionals who would be interested to join our panel discussions. And we started to get a lot of interest from consultants in interior design, architects, general managers, uh, and et cetera. And this has really created a very interesting and lively discussion, which can be seen more on our YouTube or LinkedIn channels. And it has, we have been able to provide a great deal of value. And more importantly, uh, Abid and my, my, myself, we have been learning a lot in this process, uh, considering that we both have, uh, have a privilege of working around the world for uh, quite a long time. But uh, we did, did never had this situation happen to any of us. So we're all learning as we go by how to deal with this pande pandemic uh, situation and the post-COVID situation. Well, fantastic. So we were thrilled when we were asked to put this panel together. So uh, uh, all of our viewers, hopefully from Hospitality Talk, have, have joined us on this platform today. We've got a great panel for you, uh, food and beverage professionals. So without any further ado, Sam, if it's okay, let's bring in uh, Chef Robert Wiedmeyer, who's the owner of RW Restaurant Group. Robert, welcome to this session. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here and talk about these very uh, pressing topics. It's, it's uh, definitely interesting times that we're living in, Robert. You've been in this uh, business for a very long time. Tell us how you have seen the restaurant industry and food scene evolve over the years. Well, you know, if I go back from when I first started cooking back in like the late 70s uh, to where we are today, it's changed drastically. And I'll just go through a little bit of uh, historical background. If you go from let's say 1980 to where we are now in 2020. I mean, the fact that you can go on YouTube and go learn how to make a foie gras torchon foie gras or learn how to you know, debone a duck. Uh, that was, none of that was possible until all these different uh, avenues of being on the computer were able to do that. We had to go actually go work for a chef and learn from a master chef and then pass that on and work and do that. Now you can do, I mean, my son has built, rebuilt cars off YouTube, rebuilt computers off YouTube. And you're getting a lot of novice cooks that have been able to go onto YouTube and other channels and learn how to do, how to make a Bernays sauce and how to, if a Bernays sauce breaks, how to fix it. And it's all on there, everything. So, so I've seen that kind of change. It has that enhanced the consumer expectations do they know more about food and different flavors? How has that changed when they come to dine with you? Well, if you take the food and the beverage, I'm going to combine them both. Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's made it, the, the consumer is much more educated on the products. For instance, and we just talk about, you know, where's fish coming from? They want to know if it's wild. They want to know if it's, if it's been farmed. They want to know where this is coming from. They know about truffles now. 
almost every restaurant, I mean, that's it, in a, you know, a, a hierarchy of a $60 tab, not all, but they'll have foie gras on the menu, which that was only that one time that was like, oh, they've got foie gras, it's really special. Uh, so yes, the consumers become very, very educated, not just on food, but on wine too, on beverages. Uh, you know, it used to be you could do a wine list and, you know, you didn't have robertparker.com where you could go on there and see what it's rated and what you should be paying for it. And they can do that right at the table. I mean, now because of the Food Network and the TV programs and everything else, people are much more educated on food. They, they know the terms. That's why everybody's become a foodie. <laughs> well, well, at least we, we hope to be foodies or we, we <laughs> pretend to be foodies. I don't know how well we, we are truly foodies, but, you know, technology has, has uh, uh, accelerated knowledge gains. So it, 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 tell us, it, we live in the world of YouTube, Instagram, food channels. It, it, tell us, how has that changed the business acquisition? How do you find new customers for your establishment? Well, if you use your IT stuff, if you use it properly, if you use your, your online reservation systems and actually get in there and really plug in the information, what I mean by plug in the information, not just their phone number and name and they're having an anniversary, but going beyond that, like what they normally have for a drink, what they normally do for wine, uh, what they like to eat, what they ate last time. So if you're doing, if you're running an upscale Michelin star restaurant, you have the ability to go through every single client that's coming in and have history on them about what their likes and dislikes are or what they ate last time so you don't repeat it. So it's only as good as you use it. However, on the other end, we've gotten inundated with IT stuff now. So it's like it used to be the phone would ring, you know, the person would answer the phone, the matron would answer the phone, they'd write it in pencil, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, two people, anniversary, thank you very much. Now we've got all these other systems that have attached onto the restaurant, which are actually cost you money. So it's actually, yes, it can enhance your business if you use it properly, but if you don't and just paying for it, it's actually draining money out of your pocket. So yeah, it's good and it's bad. It's all on how you use it. And there's a lot of stuff out there now. No, I mean, no doubt, wake, no doubt. And you wake up every morning and look at your phone. I can look at my phone and go, I can have every rating, every complaint, every compliment at the touch of my fingers at, at nine of my restaurants. And, and that's a good thing so that you can respond to it. You can make sure that the people are going to get the experiences that, that you are trying to deliver. At the same time, if technology is not deployed correctly, it can create issues. Robert, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam here in a second, but before I do that, I understand your operating model is you lease spaces and then you put a concept together for that particular space. Tell us what goes into selecting a site and how do you develop some of these different concepts because you've got from a Michelin star restaurant to some uh, relatively uh, casual uh, uh, dining affair. So, you know, I had Marcel's for like 10 years, which is my fine dining restaurant. I didn't open up another restaurant until after 10 years I, I did it. Well, why did I do that? One reason was, that my executive chef that was with me had been with me for a long time. So I wanted to open up another casual brasserie. Open up, no, not another one, but open up a casual brasserie, which I did, Brasserie Beck. It got selected by Esquire Magazine as the best new restaurant in 2008. And everybody thought it was a novel idea, a brasserie in Washington, D.C. I'm like, there's nothing novel about a brasserie. They're all over Paris and Brussels in, in, in the UK, I mean, in London. But in D.C., it was a big thing. Todd remembers this. Um, so... In selecting restaurants, for me, it was okay. I wanted to be able to, you know, get a bigger, wider net to feed people. So Marcel's, the average check could be anywhere from $150 to $600, depending on what you're drinking, obviously. Uh, Brasserie Beck has got an average check of $65 to $80. Uh, my Muscle Bar and Grills, which are very casual, which I, I, I did after a restaurant in Brussels called La Poubelle, which means the trash can in French. <laughs> and it's a muscle and freak place where you just eat mussels and fries and you drink Belgian beers. Very casual. We play loud rock and roll music. And that's got an average check of $35 per person. So I kind of like spread myself out there in the sense culinary wise and also being able to reach people that can't eat at Marcel's because they just can't afford it. But they can go have my cuisine at a, a much lower price and, you know, 
if you're doing everything correctly, it doesn't matter if you're cooking in a Michelin star restaurant or a brasserie, the food should be great if you have the same integrity in what you're buying and how you're using it. Are, are customers of a Muscle Bar or uh, your, your other restaurants, is one group more demanding than the other? Uh, not really. I would say, you know, on a whole, I'd say probably uh, they're easier at my more expensive restaurants and more demanding probably at my least expensive restaurants. Because if they're going to the Muscle Bar, and they think it's, you know, Chef Robert Weedmeyer's concept from Marcel's, they're high, high, high expectations when they're getting just mussels and fries and a salad or a steak frite. And they're looking at much higher expectations at a very casual restaurant sometimes. So sometimes they can be a little bit more harder on that establishment, even though it's still it was great food. But, you know, we all make mistakes in the restaurant industry. There's not, nobody does it. Not every night that we put out everything perfect. I'd like to say we do, but, you know, salt in the wrong hand, cook's hand is poison. So... <laughs> you know, it all depends on who's cooking it. I, I've never heard of that analogy, but I'll have to remember that. Uh, <laughs> Sam, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Robert, it's very interesting. I've been looking at the kind of different concepts that you have and different restaurants. Uh, and I need to ask you first, are all your restaurants currently open? Uh, just no, the, the, the only one I have not opened is Marcel's. Okay. I'm, waiting, I'm waiting on that. And the reason why is that the clientele that comes to Marcel's and spends that kind of money and wants that kind of experience are well-traveled, well-heeled individuals that, that are probably not having to worry about money and, and they're elderly. They're anywhere between 55 and 75. And I don't think they really want to put themselves at risk during this COVID pandemic and they're probably going to stay home. So I'm, I'm, I'm debating whether when I'm going to open it up or when yeah. I'm going to open it. Yeah. The, uh, I was at, before I came, uh, we started to prepare this for this uh, show. I was asking around with my friends, and uh, one of my friends is in Lyon, and uh, she asked a question. I may, maybe I can address it to you. Uh, how much do you think customer experience will suffer permanently with the changes brought by COVID? And what is this going to mean for restaurants that are heavily relying on uh, this experience? And she's referring to Michelin star rated right. restaurant. Uh, well, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think that, you know, if, when, she, when she started having the sommelier walk up to you with gloves and a mask on his face and try to explain the wines, it just takes away the whole romance, the whole experience of the dining experience. Yeah. I mean, I would say to myself personally, if I was not in the restaurant industry and I decided to go out to a restaurant, a Michelin star restaurant, and everybody's wearing masks and gloves, I'd probably look at my wife and say, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same. Right? Uh, the, yeah, I will know my in Copenhagen. This uh, Rene Redzepi has taken have uh, taking yes. a very interesting re approach by reinventing. He he opened it. Uh, he the Noma is closed as we know it with, uh, right. uh, but now he has uh, uh, he sells uh, hamburgers and wine in the, at, at the terrace. So he and, and just in order to get the very casual approach, there's no reservations required. Uh, you can just come for a glass of wine or come for a cheeseburger that costs about maybe eighteen bucks. Per burger, right. <laughs> it was going to be a good burger. Uh, boy, how do you feel about reinventing the, the concept uh, on a formal dining on a formal restaurant at this time? Does that make sense, or do you prefer to things are that you can use to open it? The, the question on that, I mean, the answer on that is that it depends on your lease. It depends on your relationship with your the entity that you're in and, and what your economics are within your lease, or if you own the building. Um, a lot of people at this time right now, a lot of chefs, a lot of restaurant tours are renegotiating their leases during this time and trying to get, you know, a deal because, you know, you're basically walking into a burning building and saying, we're going to, we're going to start cooking food here in the hopes that some people are going to come out to eat. So changing the concept of Marcel's to do burgers and stuff like that. Uh, I just don't see myself doing that at this time. Not that it won't work for some people to do that. But uh, I want to wait and see how this goes down the road with getting a, a vaccine for COVID-19. And, and hopefully things will turn and we'll get back to some normalcy here. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a couple of my friends who also are, are running some restaurants, mostly in Asia. And uh, what he was saying is that uh, uh, the kind of restaurants that are, are exceeding 
the business uh, volume that they did before are his pizzas. So meaning all the casuals, how is it for you? You have a different types of restaurants. How do you see the- Casual places are doing okay. Yeah. The ones that, the ones that are a little bit more expensive, like my Wildwood Kitchen and Lock 72 and Marcel's was not open, but the other two are open. They're not doing as much business. But the casual restaurants, they got big patios. Those are the ones that are doing business. Yeah. People want to sit outside. They want to be out. They don't want to sit inside. You can't yeah. blame them. Yeah, of course. Do you think uh, uh, somebody else was asking me, will spontaneous dining be the same or will dining become more of a planned event where people take more time to consider their options where they're going to eat? Uh, because here in Helsinki and also in uh, other places, uh, people can, can be quite spontaneous. Well, let's go and eat there uh, and because we've been there before. Or do you, do you see that people are taking the time and they're taking the time to make a reservation or before they even consider to come to the restaurant? I think people are going to be a lot more cautious. They're going to look on the internet, see what type of precautions you've taken as a restaurant in, in, your, in your policies and your steps on keeping the place sanitized. I think people are going to be very, you know, the younger people, not so much, but people that are in that age bracket that we were talking about, the 50 year olds to the 75 year olds are going to be very, very cautious about when they make a reservation, how they make a reservation, how many people you can have seated in there that night. They're going to be curious about it. But on the other hand, they might not even go out to eat oh, at that right. at a restaurant. Now, again, the casual restaurants, I think, will, will do okay during this. They're not going to make money, but they're going to break even maybe. Yeah. Have you done uh, sort of the, the kind of the takeaway systems where, I, I mean, at least here in, in the Nordics, a lot of restaurants who, who we were, were forced to be closed, but they kept the kitchen open so, right, so they can keep the staff. Pick yeah, curbside pickups never going to go away now. Yeah, I think it's here to stay. And actually, it'll be a good thing even after they get the, those pandemics over. It'll be another revenue stream for restaurants because a lot yeah. of people are going to like, oh, you know, we just call the restaurant and they bring it right out and put it in our car and we leave. Mm -hmm. And we don't feel like getting dressed up tonight or going to a restaurant. We just want to pick it up and go. So I think curbside pickup is here to stay. Okay, None of I my restaurants, you. all my restaurants will continue curbside pickup for, forever. Do you mean also that uh, will that be that you have a very particular menu that only works for that curbside or or yeah, are you gonna... you got to be really careful. A lot of the restaurants aren't doing that properly. They're they're doing food that doesn't travel well. Mm. And when you do food that doesn't travel well, and then the people get it home, they're like, "Why did I order this?" So you got to do food that travels well. Braised items, you know, you're not you should be doing you know pump free or, fr or French fries to travel. They don't travel. They'll be soggy and no go when you get them. So you got to really think the menu out, and you don't want the menu to be too big either. That's right. Great. Robert, thank you very much. They're great uh, to get uh, your thoughts on this. So back to, over to you, Babbitt. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Robert, I can relate to the food not traveling very well. Uh, recently, we had ordered some food, and by the time uh, it, it got to us, it was a total different thing than what we had <laughs> remembered dining in the restaurant. Right. So it, it is, a, it, it is a, a different segment almost uh, are dealing with the takeaways. Now, it, 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 this takeaway is going to be part of how the restaurants continue to operate. Do you have to do anything differently to make that happen? You talked about having a particularly different menu. Restaurants are thin margin business to begin with. Uh, after COVID, it's operating at 50% capacity or under other restrictions. Takeaway is another expense. Yes, it gives you revenue, but it, it does take away, no pun intended, part of your profit. Uh, well, help us understand how these different revenue streams and expenses work. Well, the cost about doing takeaway would be buying the containers and the bags for all that to go. And then just putting something on your website that they, people can go right to the website, order, and then you just, you know, they pick it up. Uh, there's not a whole lot of overhead in doing that. But, you know, there is cost in buying the takeaway stuff. I mean, the, the, the boxes and the, the bags and the instructions, you got to put down the instructions for some of the stuff. Uh, so, yeah, there is, there is some downfall. But if, it, if it's done properly and well thought out, it can actually be a really good revenue stream for all restaurants. Fantastic. Like, I would never do, like, at Marcel's, I would never do my tasting menu to go takeaway. I mean, it's just, it's impossible to do. But, you know, we could do... Some other things like my lobster bisque and my roasted tarragon chicken, we can do that to go. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. Now, Robert, in, in U.S. terms, uh, government had extended some of the help during COVID, whether it was PPP or some of the other incentives that were offered. Did you partake in any of that? Can you help us understand how that might have helped restaurateurs or hurt them? So you saw in the PPP, the payroll protection plan was going out. There was a lot of uh, chefs and restaurateurs speaking publicly about it that, that it doesn't work. It doesn't work for the restaurants. And the reason why they were saying that was is because when they first rolled it out, it was like 75% of it had to go to payroll within a very short time. So for instance, at my restaurant, if I brought everybody back the moment they gave me that money, well, they would just be standing around doing nothing, getting paid. So we said to them, we went back to the government, we went back and we pleaded. I was on uh, news with the labor secretary um, not too long ago and explained that the PPP is not sustainable. And the reason being is that if we just use up the money without making any income, and then we, when we really need the money, when we can open, it won't be there. So what's happened is a lot of the employees have gone on unemployment plus the stimulus on top of it. So they're making more money staying at home than if I was to bring them back at, let's say, a 25% reduction of their salary. So that ends in July. So the PPP has been great if you use it properly. If you don't use it properly, you know, you might owe the government a lot of money at a 1% loan over, I think it's two years, which isn't that bad. But to just take it and start paying people their payroll, paying payroll with it with no, no business, no customers was a waste of time. Waste Fair of enough. money, I should not waste, a waste of money. Yep, yep, uh, true. And, and, and quite candidly, if there is no business, the staff is not going to enjoy it hanging around. No, they don't want to be there. The morale's down. They're, 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 they don't even want to be there. So it, uh, one last question before we bring in our next guest, Robert. There are lots of things that I can continue to talk about, but uh, uh, help us understand the farm-to-table type of movement or sustainability things that are being talked about in the, in the food industry. Is it really uh, catching on or is it mostly a hype today? Well, again, so farm to table, it's, uh, I mean, I, to me, it, it's, it's kind of like a stupid thing because if you worked in great restaurants, that's all you did was bought from the local farmers and took the food that was local as much as you could and made, and made your dishes out of that. So I've always only done farm to table cooking. So farm to table kind of that term came out about, let's say about eight, nine years ago, Todd. Yeah. So farm, everybody was farm to table, farm to table, farm to table. Half the places are not doing farm to table. I mean, they just, they'll say they're doing it, but I don't think you can do all farm to table in today's market, unless you've got a little tiny restaurant out in the country and you change your menu every day, right? Fair enough, fair enough. And, and having tried that some of this from local farmers, when I was uh, based out of Asia, quite candidly, you couldn't even get enough uh, 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 produce or enough right. materials to be able to do this. So. Well, thank so we you. Try, we try our best to do that, but you can't do it all farm to table. Fair enough. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, please stay with us. There are lots of other questions. We will come back to you. But at this point, I'm going to uh, bring in our next guest, Sard Kilman, who is a journalist and editor and has been a foodie for a very long time. Uh, Todd, welcome to our session with Digital Travel Expo and Hospitality Talks. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And it's climbing, by the way. Oh, I beg your pardon. My my apologies. That's okay. How's that? How's your day been? In in the, you have seen the food uh, business evolve for a long time. Any anything you would like to add uh, relative to how this industry has changed over the last five six years? It's changed dramatically. It's changed dramatically. Um, uh, the, the, the operations of restaurants, the, the, uh, the kinds of restaurants we're seeing now, uh, and I know this both as a, a journalist and an editor and also as a consultant, we're seeing also just incredible changes that have happened within operations over the last five years. Restaurants have changed uh, dramatically the way they've been doing business, um, that's mostly been invisible 
to diners and uh, to developers and to uh, business people on the outside who are constantly looking at restaurants and, and uh, seeing how they might fit into their plans. Um, the, the food media business is in tremendous flux. Uh, the last two weeks, uh, huge changes uh, in, in this country, and I suspect they will ripple outward. Um, food media has been collapsing. Um, uh, food media over the last five, six, seven years uh, has gone through a dramatic shift. So um, there are so many people that I would consider to be amateurs in, in this mix now. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, a lot of them don't have training. Um, uh, there are people who are amateurs who are working at the professional level. Um, they're, 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 the, the market for that is in, incredibly glutted. Uh, you have people who uh, are doing aggregation. Uh, they are borrowing the the ideas and the um, the reporting of other people and repackaging it. You're seeing that happen at a at a at a level uh, which you would be probably surprised if you you knew that was going on. Um, there's a lot of slipperiness going on. The the kind of people who are doing this work now are in general, less well-traveled or the kind of traveling that I would consider to be the important kind where you're really immersed and you're, you're going on to uh, uh, soil of another country and immersing yourself in that culture and trying to understand from the inside. There's much less of that kind of travel informing the writing. Um, there's much less seriousness. I don't mean that the, the writing is stiff and ponderous. I just mean that there's a, there's a lot less real engagement and there's a, a kind of a basic trendiness and a lifestyle component that has uh, become become predominant. Uh, predominant. Um, we, we, uh, we were talking about technology and, and impact on this uh, uh, business uh, with Chef Robert. From where you said you talked about food media is, is uh, pretty much going away. Any other things that you have seen Seen that might have been a seismic shift in our industry that was brought about by technology? I mean, tech is changing almost everything that we're seeing and, and we're, we're seeing the ways that that apparatus in our lives uh, has, has set the, the, uh, the conditions for what's happening now with, with, this, with this crisis. Um, almost every... Um, uh, every exchange now is happening through tech. Uh, the restaurants that are navigating this well, the, 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 the fashionable term is pivot, the, the ones who are pivoting well are relying to an inordinate degree on tech. Um, they're in some cases changing around entire operations using different uh, point of sales, different ordering systems in order to make things possible. They're relying on uh, media campaigns to do uh, work that Previously, they would have done themselves in-house, uh, maybe at a small level, maybe going out through email and other, other means. Um, it's, it's, it's creating dramatic changes. And the, the ways that tech is a part of the food world, I mean, it's, it's something that was touched on earlier. There have there been some really good things that have come about because of it, uh, some new things that have come about because of it. There have also been a lot of bad things. And uh, we're, we're kind of in that position right now where there are people who don't necessarily know how to uh, humanize the tech. Uh, there are people who are beginning to uh, make inroads with it, do interesting things with it, um, but others who are, um, who are abusing it and who are, um, if not abusing it, but they're using it in a, a, a way that is, is not bringing about, a, a, let's say, a better world or a world of more understanding. Todd, the, the, the uh, role of a food critic, uh, in, in you and I briefly talked about it in our prior conversation, you know, when a food critic was to show up at your restaurant, all, all hell was breaking loose because chef was tense and the staff was tense. It, it, uh, is that much emphasis still being placed on the visits of food critics or are people uh, more reliant on uh, the apps that do crowdsource reviews that sort of aggregate the reviews and and consumer 
find more comfort through them? It really depends. There are restaurants where the the, the presence of a critic in the room still sends flutters and, and they will, will scurry. But for the most part, um, the really savvy restaurants know that they should be treating everybody who walks in as a potential critic because everybody now has the tools uh, to, to go out online. Um, the, the kinds of things that we're seeing now are that um, the, the, the critic is much less of a, uh, of a force, I think. Um, you, have, you have other kinds of food media people who are, who are in this. You have um, the, one of the scourges um, uh, in, in the Western world, uh, at least from my perspective as an editor and a writer, um, uh, influencers. Um, I know they're important for the role of travel, but uh, they've done some great damage in the world of, uh, of restaurants. But th this, this is a different calculus. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of big changes afoot. And, and also what's happened is that uh, people are less reliant on a single voice or a couple of key voices to give them insight. Um, uh, people seem to like uh, kind of a consumer reports, which is what um, Yelp has brought. And keep in mind, Yelp is is a company based in the United States. And the United States is a long-standing tradition of um, hostility uh, and disdain uh, toward the, the the expert, toward the one person who is educated, well-traveled, um, uh, well-watered, well-fed, who, who kind of knows and has, has taken the time to learn. Um, we're seeing the same kind of antipathy toward experts now in our, our public health crisis as well. But, but Yelp was created with that in mind, with, with the idea of giving voice to a, a range of people. Of course, what you see is you see a lot of people who, who don't know anything. And the, the, the defenders of Yelp will say, well, uh, you, you are getting an aggregate, and the aggregate, everything will even out. And uh, it sometimes doesn't work. And, and of course, there's a lot of lying that happens on, on Yelp as well. Yeah, a lot of unfortunately, I think these the, uh, uh, technology can do wonders uh, if it's used properly, but there are people that are going to abuse it no matter what segment of life that technology might exist. And uh, no different for Yelp, or if you go to TripAdvisor or any of these sites that aggregate consumer comments, uh, it becomes a challenge at times. Uh, uh, Todd, in, 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 um, tell us some of the attributes in some of the successful restaurants. What makes a restaurant really tick with the diners? Uh, and I'll turn it over to Sam here, but uh, before I do, just uh, help us understand what really makes a restaurant successful? What makes it tick with the diners? A, a great restaurant is a restaurant where all the parts are moving really well together in, in, a, in, a, in a really tight part, uh, tight tight knit of, of uh, purpose. Um, and that could be, it could be a, a simple place selling uh, uh, potatoes that get topped and it could be an elaborate, uh, uh, you know, three-star Michelin restaurant. Um, as a critic, and I ate out more than 500 times for close to 15 years. Um, what you sense is that when you're in the presence of a great restaurant, you know within about five minutes, there, there's, a, there's an energy in the room, there's a crackle, and that's not buzz. Um, and I think a lot of people who are, um, the, the, tre the trendies among us would say, well, it's about a buzz. It's not about a buzz. It's that in a good restaurant, the, the morale is really high. There's a sense of camaraderie on the floor. Um, you, you, you can tell, in a, in a good restaurant, uh, how the staff is being treated um, because that comes through and how they treat you. A lot of times diners will blame uh, a bad night on, a, on a, a server. And often the server isn't really to bear the brunt of the, the blame. The, the blame should go to management for not supporting that server, giving that server um, the means to succeed, the, the training to succeed, the, the support on the floor to succeed. So you, you sense it, you sense this crackle, this energy, this, this idea that the, the people who are on the floor who are the ambassadors for uh, the back of the house, as we say, that, that 
they they know what they're doing and they understand the role that they play and they're being supported they're being cared for and they are really an extension of that entire operation and then beyond that uh, there's there's I mean, i've seen restaurants with great food that just weren't great restaurants it's sad it's it happens more often than you think and i've seen places with with great service that that had um, uh, middling food but were somehow uh, because of the way the parts fit together, they, they became very good restaurants. Um, sometimes one element predominates, but it's really the, the gestalt, it's a fusion of these, these elements. And uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing. There, there's so many different models for success. It's a big puzzle and all the different pieces have got to fit together. One last question before uh, I turn it over to Sam. With COVID, um, our life has changed dramatically. Uh, people's dining habits were changing to begin with. COVID might have pushed it a little more. Uh, the uh, office scene in CBD is going to change because a lot of people are doing what we do, and they're working remotely. They use digital tools. How do you think restaurants can survive in this environment, but more importantly, what would you recommend that they do to thrive in this environment? I think it's, it's a great question. I think restaurants have to recognize that ultimately they are, they are the middleman. And, and what I mean by that is that on, on one end, there's, there's what we as diners, as patrons love. We love the idea of these raw materials coming into this place, people who've got years and decades of training, knowledge, uh, passion, know-how. Um, and then there's us, you know, and we, we want these goods. We want to connect to these goods. We, we like what these people are putting out. Right now, the, the middleman is suffering because we can't go to that middle. So that sounds really simple, but um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a profound idea, I think, because what a restaurant has to do is has to rethink what it is. And, and we don't tend to think of a restaurant as a middleman. Uh, we, we tend to think of them in romantic terms and, and we should. I mean, they're the places we go for uh, anniversaries and birthdays. They're the places we go to celebrate. They're the places we go when, when our, our lives are, are, are anxious and scattered and we need some kind of form of, of caress. They're the places we go to kind of negotiate, and make, make meaning. Uh, but right now we can't have that. And so the, the successful restaurants right now uh, are those that are going to say, we have this stuff, we have this ability to prepare this, this product, these products that people like, how do we get that to them? One of the things that's happening, I think, uh, and will continue to happen is that the restaurants that um, were, were the most plugged into the changes that were already happening in the last few years, um, are the ones that are probably in the best position to, to turn around and succeed. And that's to take these new systems, these new systems of simplification, um, restaurants that are taking models from fast food uh, chains um, that are simplifying their online processes. I think the restaurants that come out of this um, and, 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 and thrive or thrive in the middle of this and continue to thrive are gonna be hybrids. I mean, I'm seeing that in the work um, uh, that I'm doing a, as a consultant. I think restaurants that understand that they are more than one thing, that there's more than one thing happening under that roof uh, are best positioned to succeed. I think we start seeing things like uh, traitors, which are uh, popular in, in, in Paris. Um, where there are more, there's more than one mode of getting the, 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 the cooked processed food, uh, fabricated food, uh, gloriously fabricated to, to the patron. Um, restaurants that sort of see themselves as occupying more than one uh, niche, I think will do, will do quite well, uh, ultimately. And I think, I think what comes out of this is that our understanding of what a restaurant is has changed, that, that there are more, uh, more models. And whether that's good or bad, I don't know. It's different. Um, I think it'll be, it'll be an interesting thing. I think restaurants like Robert's Restaurant Marcel's will ultimately be, be fine. What I worry about is the restaurants below that, 
he mentioned his brasserie, Brasserie Beck. I think restaurants like that are, are um, in a more perilous position for the next few years. Or enough, I guess this, this uh, COVID, uh, uh, we still don't know exactly how it'll pan out, what will change. A lot of the social norms might change at the end of it, but uh, we'll have to stay tuned. Uh, Sam, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, observations and thoughts that you have, Todd. Um, I was wondering now, uh, do you see the, uh, what generational differences are there in what the different customers are looking for? Uh, the millennials and Z, and et cetera. What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, there's, a, there's a real generation gap in, in the food world right now. And it's going to become more profound. Um, younger diners, particularly uh, in this country, uh, are, their, their, their concerns are different. Their assumptions are different. Um, you're seeing it in things like wine. They're drinking much less wine uh, at restaurants than uh, previous generations, the, the, the baby boom generation, for example. Um, they, their, their habits, their loyalties to restaurants are different. They're not as, as bound as older generations were. Um, they are also it's in, in difficult circumstances. They, they are, uh, they are, you know, they're, they're being reshaped by this crisis. They've been shaped by the mountains of debt that um, our educational system, uh, uh, particularly college education system, um, college system has, has saddled them with um, the, the lack of housing options. They just don't have the, most of them, other than the, the well-heeled, they don't have the funds to, to go out uh, and eat uh, the way um, somebody 20 years ago who was in their early 30s uh, did, um, who's, who's a professional. And um, so they've learned to moderate. They are they're doing things like uh, they're ordering in. Their, their, their knowledge of food is probably higher than any, any other generation of Americans. They, they're going to school and they're having sushi chefs in their, in their, uh, in their uh, dining rooms. Uh, they're, they're exposed to a wide variety of cuisines. They have a broad knowledge and in some cases a deep knowledge. Um, and they're concerned about issues of, of social justice and, and widening the sphere of who is you know, allowed in the mix and what that means for, for dining. And, and just this past week, we've seen so many episodes of that in this country and the way that's gonna reshape things. So I, I think that uh, there, there's going to be, uh, uh, we're gonna look back and we're gonna see this as, as dramatic um, in the restaurant world, not just for what kinds of restaurants are still around, um, but for the kind of dining population we have and the kind of restaurant that that people tend to want. I think there's this idea of, of fine dining is, is really, I mean, it's becoming more of a relic. Uh, this might be the thing that, at least for the foreseeable future, makes it an absolute relic. Uh, and that the emphasis is on these other modes. I mean, we're seeing the rise of so-called ghost kitchens or dark kitchens. We're seeing the way that People are ordering off of uh, delivery services and, and having it brought to them. They're they're insisting on a high level of quality uh, with those offerings, uh, and they're watching a, they're watching a movie and eating restaurant food. Um, they're finding different ways to to slice this up. And again, they're looking at restaurants more as as middlemen. They're they're looking at it in a more uh, a more cynical maybe. Uh, at least a, a more practical way of, you know, what is it that I want? I want, I want the food. I want these tastes that I can't get anywhere else. I want to taste the globe. I want, I want something that gives me a sense of experience because I live in a, a mostly plastic world, a, a generic world, a world where I'm, I'm reduced to ordering things uh, online with Amazon. I never see who, who these people are. And um, I'm being dominated by tech. I'm being dominated by corporations. So this meal, maybe it's a delivery of uh, Northern Thai food and it's, uh, you know, it's some kind of a soup. I, I can feel that I'm having something authentic for at least 20 minutes. And, and that's driving a lot of what we've been seeing and I suspect it continues, continues to drive it. Okay, very interesting. Uh, you mentioned about uh, how uh, the, 
truly the, the food critics or the critics uh, uh, and the food media is, uh, uh, has a lot of challenges and maybe dying maybe is a dramatic word, but I was wondering then about uh, the restaurant rating systems and uh, sort of that official rating systems. How are they doing? Are they, is that, uh, do you think that's still going to be surviving or is that this thing of a past where the traditional rating agencies uh, like Michelin and so on are, uh, doesn't have the credibility uh, that they had before? What is your thoughts on that? I'm not sure Michelin has the credibility that it used to have, you know, to begin with. Um, yeah. uh, it's become very hard to understand exactly what their standards are as they've gone outside of Europe. Um, other other rating services, I you know, ratings are going to to stay with us because people like them. They 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 like that digestibility. I I don't. I always try to get rid of ratings. Um, rating scales wherever I was, uh, just because I wanted people to read the words. I wanted them to take the time to, to, to read this piece that, that I thought was a contribution in some way to the culture. And that instead had of just reading the stars. Right? Yeah, no, instead of just looking point. at stars. Um, and, and a lot of times what happens is you'll, you'll sometimes read a review and you'll say, well, it's great. Why is it two stars? Um, and I was, I was at a publication that that insisted on stars uh, because uh, that's, that drives uh, ad budgets, it drives circulation. Um, but what happens is that um, people become really hung up on stars. I would get calls from people and they'd say, well, it's a special occasion. I wanna go to such and such a restaurant. You gave it three and a half stars, you gave it four stars. And I'd say, well, you probably are not gonna be happy there. And they'd say, why? And I'd say, well, because restaurants at that level they're getting those stars in part because they are doing something to uh, to push the 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 conversation, if you will, in some way. They're they're doing creative things or innovative things, or they're doing them in a in a in a different way that feels new and exciting. They're not just simply putting out food. And most people, most people who live a uh, an ordinary middle class, uh, you know, bourgeois existence would be happy with a two and a half star restaurant. It's going to satisfy them at the, the base level, um, be a little cheaper too. Um, those, those restaurants are really for people who are culinary adventurers, not even foodies, but people who are really, they live to eat and they're living for sensation and they're, they're going into a restaurant with that sense that you go into a theater, you know, show me something new delight me, entertain me, take me out of my, my daily existence, my, my fears and my anxieties and, 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 you know, my world. Great, great food can do that. Not every, not every restaurant can do that, but great food can do that. Okay. My final question is, uh, what do you see uh, some trends in the cuisine or if you, so to speak, new trends, if you will, that you are seeing emerging now in, in particularly in the U.S. or maybe elsewhere? Um, you're seeing a lot of chefs with uh, Robert's level of experience uh, and training, and dedication to craft, um, passion, expertise, doing fast food or doing some version of fast food. That uh, has been going on for a few years now, about four or five years now. Um, it's continued to, to uh, gain ground uh, before, the, before COVID. I think it becomes one of the, the dominant modes of a restaurant um, for one reason that, that we haven't gotten into, which is that restaurants are exceedingly expensive, rents have been really high, and labor uh, in this country in particular has just been a problem across the board. It is really hard to find, Robert can attest to this, really hard to find dedicated, experienced people uh, to, to do that. We're, we're even talking about finding uh, uh, inexperienced people um, at, at a low level, the difficulty of finding folks like that to just wash dishes, for example. And so um, what savvy restaurateurs have been doing is figuring out ways to adopt these uh, or adapt these fast food models and, and, and use them to streamline operations, to eliminate labor, um, to to kind of have a much more machine uh, style to the preparation of their food. We've seen chefs who are doing things like um, 
I've, I've joked uh, to, to some chefs about it. It's sort of more like um, parfait assembly where everything is done in the prep. Lots of sauces, um, lots of uh, squeeze bottles, lots of different um, uh, mise en place touches and the food is assembled rather than cooked. Uh, somebody at Robert's level and with that classical background, um, their, their typical system is when an order comes in, the pan gets warmed up, you know, knob of butter goes down and the dish begins to get cooked. Uh, that's happening less and less and less because people are having to rethink uh, systems in order to get around these problems, these problems of labor, um, these problems of high rent. And, you know, what we haven't touched on is, is what the role of development is in all this and, and business. And uh, we've, we've been seeing investors not, uh, not supporting restaurants, moving away from supportive restaurants. Uh, we've been seeing uh, developers needing more and more restaurants in their developments because Amazon is just flattened uh, retail. And so things that are tactile are more and more needed. Nail salons, massages, restaurants, grocery stores, those are the anchors of, of retail. But it puts an inordinate pressure on restaurants to perform, uh, the need for more restaurants, and it continues to glut the market and, and thin the labor. So uh, the restaurants that emerge out of this will be lean models. They, you know, they, I, I can foresee a, a, a new generation of restaurants with fewer than 10 people working in them. It's going to be it's going to be really interesting to see how that pans out. Todd, please stay with us. Uh, unfortunately, we're uh, running over our time, so uh, I'm going to bring in our next guest at this point, Mike Lawless, who is the project manager with the Blue Plate Studio. Mike, welcome to our session. Thank you, Avid. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, well, Mike, uh, tell us from a designer point of view. What have you seen that has become critical in restaurant designs? Uh, what is important in making those experiences really work? I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting question, especially considering the situation we find ourselves in globally at this current time. I think that it was, I wouldn't say a constant battle, but something that was always these sort of two sides to the coin of uh, the considerations that you had to think about when designing a restaurant is form and functionality. You, you want to make an attractive product that works operationally. I'm sure Robert will, will attest having probably worked in restaurants that maybe weren't designed so successfully and ones that were, and, and there's a big, big difference. And now in this sort of very, very strange time that we find ourselves living in, I really think that there's going to be a, a third aspect that will take as as big an importance in regards to and that's safety i think it's going to it's going to really drive a lot of the decisions that we as designers make in the context of a post-pandemic world and of course i agree with um, with what todd was saying in regards to the need for a vaccine is is going to then sort of allow us to return to a certain level of normalcy but at the same time this has been such a, a such a profound global event that it really will impact the way that people dine and experience restaurants moving forward. So I think um, sort of health and safety considerations, rather than just ticking the box for government government uh, permits, are going to be absolutely paramount in the in the coming years. Well, uh, Mike, you've done a lot of work internationally, particularly uh, when you go to Asia and Middle East. You know, buffets are a huge thing. Consumer wants them. But, uh, hotel and restaurants, particularly restaurants attached to the hotels, they put these lavish buffets together. Is COVID the nail in the coffin for buffets? Uh, you took the words out of my mouth, Avid. I really do think so. It's, um, I mean, it's something that pre-COVID, we were seeing really the, the dwindling down of buffets around the world. I think it was something that some of the trends that, that Todd and Robert touched on in regards to what's been driving sort of the restaurant and food and beverage industries over the last five years is this reach towards authenticity in terms of the experience and the food. And buffets don't necessarily play into that. And it's something that we, as, as a designer from our, our clients and hotel operators that we partner with on our hotel projects, yeah. Well, the um, a vast reduction in the request for buffets and what this meant in sort of luxury products was 
um, more a la carte service, especially in Asia and the Middle East, as you say. But then in more limited service food and beverage offerings in, um, in sort of select service hotels, we would see the rise of this sort of coffee shop model with the, the grab and go counters, um, allow people to come for a, a grab a quick bite on their way out at the beginning of the day, a coffee, a sandwich, a pastry, something like that. And I think then now with, with COVID-19, it's going to be very difficult to convince people to come back to buffets. It already was was a dated um, a dated model when it comes to. I, I agree. I agree. Yep. Yeah, it's something that just it's it's going to be very difficult to health and safety standards. But then also you think about it from a sustainability standpoint, food wastage, all of those items. It's it's I think it's a, a thing of the past, quite frankly. In in the, uh, uh, Mike, in your. Um, when you design concepts and you've done a lot of work, do you prefer freestanding restaurants with individuality? Do you like the, if the concept is successful that that can be replicated around the world? What has uh, what has been successful from your point of view? Um, I would say there's not there's not really a straight answer for that because it really depends on the client on the style of the project. I've worked on some on some restaurants in sort of huge chain hotels, and then I've worked in uh, on independent restaurants with just a uh, it was the the passion project for an entrepreneur opening his first restaurant, and it they're very enjoyable for different reasons. I think that the the independent the independent projects you find yourself having more freedom and it's more of sort of a conversation with the, uh, with the owner and the entrepreneur and, and the chef as well. And it's really uh, a very collaborative spirit in that sense. However, it's not without its challenges. Oftentimes budget might not be as, as big, but also there could be issues surrounding uh, a lack of standards, for example, uh, a lot more questions for us as designers in regards to, okay, well, is this, uh, is this legally allowed and talking with, with the local permitting agencies, et cetera versus when you work for the for a, a larger brand be it a larger brand a, a larger hotel brand or a larger restaurant brand they have their standards in place and it's very sort of cut and dry what it is uh, your role is and what it is that you have to do in order to execute this so those projects tend to run very smoothly but then they might not have the same kind of freedom to to express yourself creatively i think it's it's give and take it, it really depends i think personally i prefer working on a mix of both of those types you mean you don't, like, you don't like the change orders? Oh, I love change, change orders. <laughs> that, that wasn't my fault. That was the designer's fault. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's always our fault. <laughs> uh, Sam, we, we are uh, pressed for time. So let me turn it over to you uh, and I'll come back. Well, I'll just do a quick question. I know there is, uh, it's, uh, in our normal shows, we, we just go for a, uh, we don't look at the clock here, but here we have uh, some uh, time pressing. But uh, I want to just ask, uh, how do we address social aspects and ambience with phys physical distancing? Uh, does it come in play when you are now starting to, uh, you're creating some designs or is it something that is not uh, as important for you in the design stage? I mean, there are a few things to consider here. I think that it's, um, first, how long is this going to last? Nobody knows. And there's certain, temporary fixes that people are doing, a, a big shift towards outdoor dining, as was mentioned before by both Robert and Todd, which is huge for the restaurant industry being able to get back on its feet in that sense. But ultimately, I think that um, what Todd was touching on earlier, this idea that the crackle that you get from a successful restaurant and really just the, the joy out and the joy of, of leaving your home to go to a restaurant is something that so many of us have been starved of in the last few months. And while it's gonna be strange to get back there, it's something I can't wait to do. And the, it's going to be a very sort of delicate balance, a careful dance between returning to a level of normalcy, but allowing certain safeguards um, to, to ensure that there's not virus transmission, et cetera. I, I actually, I walked past a restaurant the other day in Upper Manhattan, and it was a, a fine dining restaurant. And the waiters were all white glove service, silver platters, uh, and the old school sort of white blazers. And on the silver platters were, was just a single bottle of hand sanitizer <laughs> on the terrace of this restaurant. And it was so weird to see, but it's commendable because at least they're trying to put their own signature on 
on this this weird time that we find ourselves in this trying to reopen and social distance distancing of course is going to be a part of that and we're going to have to consider that in our interior design jobs as we go forward but the hope is that the a vaccine will come around sooner rather than later and we'll be able to to return back to that because ultimately seat count is is so critical to it's so directly related to revenue of a restaurant that it's impossible to say to a restaurant no 50 percent of your seats can't operate right, right. Yeah. Yeah. thank yeah, you uh, okay thank you very much i uh, appreciate your answers here and uh, over to you abit uh, Mike, one, one question, and then we'll bring uh, everybody back together for a little bit. Um, it, what changes do you see in designs going forward? Now, uh, the, the delivery component, so curbside pickup, is, is uh, here to stay. Uh, the the di social distancing might be around. Buffets might be gone. Any, any things that you think are going to be permanent in design changes moving forward? What I would love to see in terms of uh, a more permanent shift in, in the way that we see our restaurants is really on a, on a more macro level is zooming out and looking at how we inhabit the spaces in which we live in the cities that we live. And it has to be a shift in the streetscape. We, I live here in New York City and I think it's cities across America. It's, it's dedicated to providing uh, road travel. And that's just not sustainable in, in this current time that we find ourselves. And it's really this, this pandemic, as awful as it has been for so many people around the world, it presents an opportunity. And from it, we have to adapt. And I think starting to allocate more space in our cities for public, public use, for, for dining, for outdoor dining, is a great step towards limiting the, the use of cars in heavily trafficked urban areas. That's good. To sort of create this... this almost on the European model that you see the Parisian corner bistros and the piazzas right. of Rome, they're full of tables. And actually just uh, this week, there's talks of Arthur Avenue, um, sort of the epicenter of Little Italy in the Bronx, closing down the entire um, three block, an entire three block stretch of Arthur Avenue to create a 100 table uh, dining piazza based on the Italian model. And it's this a certain sort of poetry to that, that it's, it's an Italian immigrant nation back towards the way the Rome and European cities that way and to adapt in that way to this time and I think that's a, a big marker of it um, just be for fair weather times as we've seen in, in European cities right. you outdoor heaters you can have these kind of semi-permanent structures that allow for comfortable outdoor dining and that's something that I think is is has the potential to really redefine the way we use our cities and restaurants can be at the forefront of that, uh, that approach and that rethink. Well, I hope the pedestrian uh, are uh, incorporated into urban planning because I think that'll be healthier living and businesses will thrive because there'll be more foot traffic. So let's, uh, let's bring everybody back together. And Robert, I'm going to uh, start with you asking one quick question, gain consumer confidence and loyalty in age of Yelp and in age of COVID, Robert. Wow, uh, get customer confidence. I mean, I mean, they get their confidence back in dining in the restaurants. Yes, and I their loyalty. Be, so that they will. Well, the, the, the loyalty is going to come from you know people that come in there and have great service and great food and come back and walking out going that was a great experience. That's your best advertising. That becomes your loyalty. People go out and go, you got to go to this restaurant. But we've already got that going on. It's like, how are we going to get them to have the confidence come back in and still be loyal? Like, I'm putting out an email next week to all my customers, 45,000 people from Marcel's, that I'm going to reopen on this date, and I'm only taking 40 covers a night. So I want to see how many people, loyal customers of mine, say, okay, I'm going to come out for dinner. So, I mean, the question is, just, it's a hard one to answer a bit because it's like, you know, I don't know if you're starting from ground zero to do that, you know, you're gonna have to do, well, we're here, we got great service, we got great food, but we're also being very safe with the COVID-19 procedures. Fair enough. And Todd, a question for you is for the budding entrepreneurs that are looking to open restaurants, uh, would you have a system 
for them and advice that they can uh, rely on? Uh, apart I think, from don't. <laughs> apart from don't, right. Um, actually, it's, it's funny. I used, to, I used to teach college. I, I, I was a professor at Howard University for seven years. And one of my students has been working to open uh, a wine bar. And, and he's actually opening that uh, next month. Uh, really terrible timing. What, what I would say is, is one basic thing is that I think in the early days of the, the crisis, we were in a kind of a triage phase and, and it was enough for restaurants simply to get, get product out and people were just happy to have that connection and, and to feel they could support the, the restaurants that had, had been part of their lives. Um, we're in a new phase of this and it's an uncertain phase. And in this phase, the, the kind of work that um, I'm going to be do I'm doing some of already with clients is to help them rethink hospitality. What, what do you have to do now at an era when you, you have to be contactless? And that means not just contactless with the tech, but you can't be close. You have to have a mask you know, that, that smile is, is gone, that, that sense of warmth is gone, people are at a remove, uh, the spaces have to be reconfigured. Um, there's, there's, a, there's an aesthetic loss there, there's, a, there's, there's a, an emotional, spiritual loss. And so restaurants have to make up for that. It is different things that they try to make up for that, rethinking the way that they um, package are repackaging their hospitality. They can't. They can't do it in the old ways. Yeah, um, so yeah. They're going to have to use tech to do that. They're going to have to use um, uh, the online uh, means to do that. They're going to have to use greetings to do that. Um, I guess it's all different uh, tools are going to have to be uh, thought through because what was applicable might not be applicable tomorrow. So, um, uh, Mike, a question for you. You talked about uh, the the sanitizer on the silver platter. Hopefully the dispenser was sterling silver and the sanitizer had uh, gold flakes in it. But <laughs> it, do you see UV lights becoming part of the design element moving forward? There, there's definitely some interesting technologies out there to, to explore. Um, however, there's also a lot of questions. There's also almost more as it comes to such as UV light. The, some of the, the solutions we've been looking at um, it depends so much on uh, length of exposure, the intensity of the light, and the surface that it's actually applied to that it, it may not be effective. And so there's still a lot to learn in regards to how this virus can be combated using uh, technological solutions. But I think as Todd, as Todd mentions that it's, it's more, how do we use that technology? How do we harness that technology to, to create more contactless solutions or, or safer environments? And people, do don't really, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting balance because people don't want to feel like they're walking into a hospital right. restaurant. But at the same time, there's going to be a certain, like, I think that, that all of these sanitary measures that were taken, the restaurants have been doing for years since before coronavirus was uh, always done in the background. You never wanted to see anything that would suggest that there was anything ever that needed to be cleaned up, which obviously is absurd because you want all the tables to be sanitary. Yeah. But then now there's, it's, there's an interesting shift, I think, that there's going to be more of a, a desire from the guests to know that the, the space where they're sitting is clean and sanitary. I think the hus hospitality industry or hotel industry specifically offers an interesting example, which is the the partnering with between major brands and major um, major hospitality brands and then major healthcare brands or um, sanitary disinfectant providers, for example, Lysol and I think it's Hyatt, but I might be wrong on that, have partnered that when a guest comes to their guest room door, there's a sticker that seals the door that says your room has been disinfected with Lysol or whatever. And then when you open the door, that seal breaks. So you know that you're the first person to walk into that room since that happened. And I feel like it's going to be small adjustments and small touches like that rather than a complete rethink. Fair of enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, the unfortunate thing is there was recently an expose in New York City about the hotels that the, a few of the hotels were not even practicing the basic things pre-COVID. Look, we, we run out of time. We always finish our, our, our show with one feel-good thing. And so I, it would be remiss if we didn't do that. 
So I'm going to start with Todd. Todd, anything in a very quick way, anything uplifting, anything that you might have seen or learned something about yourself, please. Humans are adaptable and uh, we're all alive. <laughs> That's a great thing. Uh, Robert, over to you. I'd say um, getting to spend time with my 17 year old son that I never probably would have spent this much time the past three months with him has been really nice. Oh, that's fantastic. That is awesome. And Mike, last but not least, first side. I think that I'm so inspired by the countless moments of generosity and giving in this time that people are experiencing such hardship themselves, but at the same time are willing to, to lend their time, their efforts, their money, et cetera, to, to help other people. It's just amazing. And I think in the, in the restaurant industry, we're seeing a lot of that as well, which is, it's right. remarkable. Well, that is quintessential hospitality. On that note, thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, Mike, for joining this session. Sorry we ran over. Hopefully our viewers uh, got a lot out of this. It will be a recorded session that would be made available for those of us uh, who couldn't join live. Uh, so thanks from uh, my side. Thank you to all of our uh, viewers that joined live. Sam, over to you, please. Well, my, just my final words, I want to thank uh, Buzz Digital Travel Expo for giving the hospitality talks the venue to have a, a great panel discussion. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you.